I'm Tisha Bader with Shalom TV's news update for Friday, January the 31st, 2014. Israeli Air Force jets struck terror targets in Gaza this morning in retaliation for rocket fire from Gaza into Israel last night. Israel Radio reported that a rocket fired from Gaza landed in the Sdot HaNegev Regional Council in Israel last night. It fell in an open field and no damage or injury was reported. The IAF launched a counter-strike this morning targeting a rocket launching site in Gaza as well as a weapons manufacturing facility there. Palestinian media reported that several Palestinians were wounded in the strike. Israel's Defense Minister Moshe Alon confirmed reports of direct hits on the intended targets in Gaza and restated that Israel would not tolerate rocket attacks. He said the IDF and other security forces will continue to chase after those who shoot at Israel or try to execute terror attacks, and they will not hesitate to attack those attempting to do so. According to a press release put out by the IDF spokesperson's office today, the month of January showed a spike in terror activity from Gaza, including a total of 28 rockets being fired from the Strip into Israel. Disturbances were reported today on the border fence between Israel and the northern Gaza Strip. The IDF spokesperson said that approximately 100 Palestinians gathered in the security zone along the border fence and ignored IDF calls and warnings to disperse. The IDF said its forces fired warning shots in the air, which were also ignored, and IDF forces fired and hit one Palestinian man who was said to be the organizer of the disturbances. Palestinian media reported that the 27-year-old man was in moderate condition and being treated in the hospital for a bullet wound to his foot. Leaders from the United Nations, United States, Russia and the European Union will meet tomorrow in Munich to see how they can push along U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry's Middle East peace efforts. The so-called Quartet of Middle East Peace Mediators are EU Foreign Policy Chief Catherine Ashton, who will chair the meeting with Secretary of State Kerry, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, and Quartet Envoy, former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Ashton said she hopes that together the group could help with the challenging issues that lay ahead for both parties. Ashton said this meeting takes place in a moment when difficult and bold decisions need to be made. The dividends of peace for Israelis and Palestinians, she said, are enormous. Meanwhile, Ynet reports that Mideast Peace Envoy Martin Indyk revealed some details of the framework deal that Secretary of State Kerry is set to soon present to the Israelis and Palestinians. Indyk told a conference of Jewish organizations yesterday that the framework agreement will include compensation for Palestinian refugees and will also reference the right to compensation for Jews who were forced to flee Arab countries when Israel became a state. He reportedly said that about 75 to 80 percent of Jewish settlers will be allowed to stay in their West Bank homes as part of land swaps based on the 1967 borders. The Times of Israel cited Indyk saying that the framework agreement would describe, quote, Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people and Palestine as the nation state of the Palestinian people, adding that the deal would not hold any real surprises for Israeli or Palestinian leaders and that it would be presented to them within a few weeks. The government of Norway has ordered the divestment from two Israeli companies because of their construction in Jewish settlements in East Jerusalem. Norway instructed state-run pension fund Government Pension Fund Global, or GPFG, not to invest in Israeli construction companies Africa Israel and its subsidiary Danya Sebus yesterday. The Israeli firms had been excluded from GPFG previously for their building in the West Bank and were then reinstated last summer, but now the ban once again was put into place because of the East Jerusalem building. Africa Israel spokeswoman Dalia Azar Malimovka told Reuters that the company abided by the laws of whichever country it operated in. She said Africa Israel and its subsidiaries operate both in Israel and all over the globe, promoting their business activities according to the legislation applicable in all countries where they operate. Therefore, she said, we can only express regret over the decision regarding Africa Israel and other major Israeli companies. The Jerusalem Post reports that the decision was seen in Israel as odd, 
because the Norwegian Pension Fund actually has no investment in Africa Israel, and it also wasn't clear why Africa Israel was singled out of all the companies building in the settlements. The Post said that Israel's foreign ministry had no comment on the matter. The Jewish community of Bolivia inaugurated the country's first Jewish museum with some financial help from Germany. Jewish Argentinian website Radio High reported yesterday that the ceremony took place earlier this month in Cochabamba, 250 miles southeast of the capital La Paz. According to Ricardo Udler, the president of the Jewish community of Bolivia, a large portion of the funding for the museum came from the German government. The German embassy in the Bolivian capital said the museum in Bolivia commemorates the history of European Jews who found refuge there during the Nazi dictatorship in the country. The president of Belgium's parliament condemned remarks made earlier this month by one of its lawmakers, who said that Zionists were responsible for the Holocaust. On January the 16th, independent Belgian lawmaker Lorraine Louis said in parliament that the Holocaust was set up and financed by the pioneers of Zionism. He also made the canal gesture, which is said to be a reverse Nazi salute. Parliament President André Flahaud reacted to Louise's actions last week, where he condemned the lawmakers, quote, hateful acts. Vice President of the Belgian League Against Anti-Semitism, which is a new watchdog group, said that he did not want to give Louise a platform. However, he said based on the tens of thousands of visitors to his website, it was clear that Louise represented a threat that needs to be confronted. And the CCOJB, the umbrella group representing French-speaking Belgian Jews, said last week that it would file a complaint against Louis. Longtime Jewish Congressman Henry Waxman announced that he will retire at the end of the congressional session. Waxman, who is 74, is known as the Dean of Jewish Lawmakers. He was first elected to Congress in 1974 and is the longest serving Jewish House member. He said in a statement yesterday, I am grateful for my supporters and allies who have worked side by side with me to fight for issues we care about, health, environmental protection, women's and gay rights, and strengthening the ties between the United States and our most important ally, the State of Israel. The Jewish Federations of North America Senior Vice President for Public Policy and Director of its Washington office, William Daroff, released a statement calling the congressman a champion of Jewish communal concerns. Daroff said Henry Waxman has devoted his career to fulfilling the Jewish concept of tikkun olam, repairing the world, in ensuring the safety of food and drugs, working to promote affordable health care, and being a stalwart leader in building a strong U.S.-Israel relationship. Daroff also praised Waxman's work in strengthening the Clean Air Act and in standing up for the rights of Holocaust survivors in the U.S. The World Jewish Congress hosted 30 young Jewish professionals from 18 different countries in Brussels earlier this week for a two-day training session in diplomacy and outreach. The goal of the event, called the Diplomacy Project, is to give these young Jewish professionals who are members of the WJC's program, the Jewish Diplomatic Corps, the necessary tools to advance the World Jewish Congress's diplomatic agenda. The young diplomats heard presentations from ambassadors and diplomats from Austria, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Israel, and met with the head of protocol of the Council of the European Union. World Jewish Congress CEO Robert Singer said the seminar demonstrated the synergies that exist across the World Jewish Congress. He said, I am convinced that these outstanding young people who are so committed to working on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people will be a key asset for the WJC in the future. And that's Shalom TV's news update for Friday, January the 31st, 2014. I'm Tisha Bader. Remember, live Shabbat services from New York City's Central Synagogue are coming up tonight at 6, followed by a Shabbat a cappella concert at 7.30. Shabbat Shalom.